is put my um, page. There it is. All right. All right, so um, I think I have it all set up here. And I just need to click present. Okay, so um, Andrew, do you think it'd be good to just take a moment just to introduce everybody? We don't have that many folks here. Yeah. So I'll start, I'll just say, my name is Oscar. I, wear, I am with Cooperation Humboldt. I have been working on this curriculum and this presentation alongside Andrew from American Red Cross and some of my colleagues. Uh, we're really excited to work with Huff because we really you know, see you guys as, as a key player in your own community, within our community. And we just appreciate having people who are already thinking of these ideas and interested to at least check it out because we need to hear from you guys to make sure that whatever we offer is relevant. Um, and so I'll pass to um, Eve. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Eve and um, I'm a member of HAF, um, Humboldt Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Um, I'm on the Social Action Committee, and um, last week's um, talk was very, very interesting, and I'd like to see where we're going with all of it, and um, um, I have a lot of hopes for the future <laughs> now that things are politically starting to... Um, to elevate themselves. Okay, um, shall I pass this on to someone? I'm going to pass this on to Amy. Um, I'm Amy, um, she, her pronouns, and I'm the engagement coordinator at Huff. Um, and I'm just really excited um, about this, this relationship between in Cooperation Humble and Huff starting and deepening. Um, just, I, um, I think this is just, I know that when we come together and share resources and ideas and, you know, pull, pull all of that together, there's so much more that we can, can collectively create than if we kind of isolate and try to figure out all the problems on our own. So thank you so much, <laughs> Oscar and Andrew for um, sharing this with us. And I hope it's just a little seedling of what's to come. So yeah, thank you. Andrew, do you wanna go next? Sure. So I'm Andrew, I'm the disaster program manager for the American Red Cross. I cover Humboldt, Del Norte and Trinity. Um, let's see, I've been here since everything started shutting down for COVID. So I think I'm right about nine months. So I'm really new to the area and as we, scaled up to meet the need for the wildfires, uh, we actually didn't have enough volunteers. And it was through our relationship with uh, Cooperation Humboldt that really brought forth a lot of, you know, huge hearts, you know, you know, rolled up sleeves and some open hands and really made up that difference where we really struggled when it came to volunteers. And that got us talking about this process of, you know, community resiliency, how to work with other partners and how to kind of collectively grow our strength and resilience um, in the face of adversity between not just our two organizations, but other organizations. How do we not just encourage them to take this on, but also how do we empower them to take their next steps? Uh, because yeah, it's, it's awesome that I get to do stuff like this because it's so nice to have these sort of conversations 
versus what I did this afternoon, which was talking to someone who's lost their home because of a fire. I'd rather focus on getting on the front end and taking care of people's needs. And hopefully we, it's, the best disaster is the one you never have. So uh, I'm glad to have, you know, uh, an audience of individuals willing to listen to stuff like this. I always appreciate, you know, always appreciate it. So I don't see a list of names. Um, the next person I see is Humboldt Fellowship. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I'll pass to you. Uh, that's fine. Uh, my name is Scarlett Tripsmith and I am the Huff Tech for today. And I just wanted to let all of you guys know um, how grateful I am to be here. Uh, my family is all from Sonoma County and throughout the past like five years, it's like every, t every time it's summer or fall, like some disaster is happening down there. So I'm really intrigued to hear what you guys have to say today. And uh, I'm happy to be your Huff representative today as well. And I will pass it off to Philip. Mic check, can you hear me? Hey, uh, my name's Philip. I'm also new to the area. Um, I was a um, uh, stage technician, uh, tech support uh, in the Bay Area in San Francisco, and uh, also a, a ferry um, deckhand in the ferry system uh, in San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, when the pandemic happened, I just left um, to Lake County, where I was actually also um, uh, volunteering and uh, at a farm, at multiple farms, but mainly one farm and, and fire preparedness was one issue that we had to deal with. And um, and now I'm here, I'm just kind of keep on going north, but I would like to kind of stop going north. So maybe this is a good good place. So just interested what this group's about. Well, that's, that's great. Well, welcome all. Um, thank you all for taking the time to check in. Um, usually when crowds are small, I think it's good to just get a good grasp of where we all are and just to know a little bit more just helps us get centered. But we'll go straight into the presentation. So organizational disaster preparedness. Um, this is gonna, oh, sorry. So we're gonna just do a little quick overview here and just give you a rundown of what the presentation is gonna look like this week. Mostly we're gonna have Andrew from American Red Cross giving a rundown of the Red Cross Ready Rating Program. Uh, we'll get deeper into that a little bit later, but just know that it's self-paced. Um, it's also accessible. Um, it's kind of like the first stepping stone. Um, and then there is how can a community organization such as Huff, uh, you know, what can we do to, what can it do to prepare itself? Um, and so we'll be talking about components on like what does resilience and inner resilience look like? And so when we talk about preparedness, it won't just be blaying out preparedness. We're gonna talk about the components of preparedness, what makes up preparedness, where is this immediate support? Where can you find it? Um, and then that's how we're gonna really get into resilience. So I'm gonna go ahead and hop in. So the Red Cross uh, Ready Rating Program is really meant for community organizations, faith-based organizations, uh, businesses, uh, really anybody that, that any, any entity that has a number of individuals that are either on site or work for them, uh, that can be paid staff or unpaid staff, which we lovingly refer to as volunteers. Um, but there really is, there, there's two different paths that you can take with this. And I always, I would recommend starting off with the ready go and the, the there's ready go and then ready advanced are the two different avenues you can take. It is, um, you can search ready, uh, ready rating, uh, .org or ready.org. It's on red cross. You can find it through red cross. I can send you the link with It's actually in the resources in this presentation. Um, but it is a free self paced, uh, program that uh, really the, the, the ready go portion, it took, I actually did it in preparation for this, this conversation. And it took me about 15 to 20 minutes to get through the basic, the basic version of this. And there's gonna be more on that to follow, but I logged off because I had to do some work and I came back and it saved my progress, asked me to pick up right where I left off. But the idea is I can revisit that site a year from now and then articulate how our resiliency as an organization has grown and how we've improved. But 
the one of the things that this program does is it actually helps an entity or an organization, a business, a church, a school, uh, or a faith-based organization more appropriately, um, you create what's called an emergency action plan. And that, that emergency action plan actually is re required by OSHA. If you have 10 members within your organization, particularly they usually mean staff, but if you have 10 people at any given time, uh, you should have an emergency action plan uh, for your, your group or your entity. And so we're gonna get into that as we go on. So this is actually my score. Uh, the American Red Cross scored a total, a whopping total of 63% on our readiness. But the reason I show that it, it's not pass or fail. Um, you act, first step is it's first is a three-step registration process, and it's putting in uh, your info. You know, whoever is going to fill this out, it's putting in your information, your contact information, um, and, and a way for you to log back in. You're really just creating a profile in this system. And so you're asked to register. And that's how we know how to say, associate the data that you put in with you. And what I ended up doing was uh, you, take, you, can, you take a survey. It's either 25 questions or 60 questions, depending on which path that you take. Please just do the 25 question one. It's much faster. It's a great place to start. Um, and then what it does is it will give you a next, next step reports and you can actually see the link there. It says next steps. It'll print off a next step report. So based on how you answer those survey questions, it will make the survey makes suggestions based on your answers. And so I'll actually pick on some of the things that I didn't do too great at when I filled it out for myself. Uh, right now, I currently don't have I'm sorry, it's actually on the next slide. I got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> um, so this, this is actually the what it will look like, the next step survey. Um, so you log on, you go through the survey, uh, you, you answer the questions and it'll generate this report for you. And the idea is, is usually this is your OSHA compliance individual. This is your person on your board who is kind of responsible for safety on site. Uh, it usually falls to them to complete this. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it could be anybody who's interested in preparedness within your organization. Uh, but you fill out a survey, it generates this report for you, and it'll give you an executive summary, kind of a, a, a dashboard of here's everything that we know based on what you put into it. But then it actually generates some next steps. It gives you a checklist. It gives you a, uh, it's actually, if you want to go back real quick, but it gives you a checklist and it, it will actually at the end prompt you on how to create your emergency action plan based on the, how you answer the questions. Uh, again, that emergency action plan, uh, so anyways, I'll get into where we didn't do too good. So it, the survey covers five categories, uh, participation, and that's uh, from your members. Does your leadership participate in preparedness? Does your leadership encourage your members to participate? Um, does it encourage a, a safe working environment? And things like that, that's, that's what the first uh, category is. The second category is, what have you already done in regards to emergency planning? Have you mapped out evacuation areas? Have you, uh, have you indicated locations that people could meet if you had to evacuate your building? Imagine uh, you have individuals you know, working at, on site the fire alarm goes off. Is there a point that everyone is aware of that, hey, we're all going to go to that one location and then we're going to kind of get a count of everybody because the fire department needs to know if they need to go back and get someone. The next one is equipment. Uh, that's, the other that's the next category it covers. And equipment is really, do you have AEDs on site? Do you have a first aid kit on site? Do you have, uh, if, if your building isn't exactly a AED, sorry, a ADA compliant, do you have the means to overcome that? And then the last, uh, the next one is training and exercises. So once you've developed your emergency plan, what sort of things do you have in place to practice that plan? And do you practice a, a, uh, a fire drill once a year? Uh, do you practice calling down all of the members and telling them, hey, it's, don't come to work today, it's dangerous. Um, ha have you practiced that? And then the last category is your extended community. It asks some basic questions about how does your organization interoperate with those partners throughout your community. 
uh, because nobody is expected to operate in a vacuum and we're stronger uh, collectively as a community. And it, so it, the survey will cover those five categories and I'll cover the ones that we didn't do so good at. So for one, I'm missing an AED. Of all organizations that should have an AED on site, uh, we don't have one. So that means I have to work with my leadership to procure one. Uh, the next one is I don't actually have an up-to-date emergency action plan for my own organization. So that's something in the next coming weeks that I'm going to have to build. In short, I didn't inherit one from my predecessor. I do not have an emergency response team within my, my leadership. And because I don't have leadership volunteers all squared away just yet. Uh, the other thing is digitally, I don't have a way to access my, uh, my forms. If I were to lose power and I have all of my important documents about where are shelters located, who are my volunteers, how do I contact those volunteers? I don't have a, for lack of better term, a dumb backup, like an analog running list of paper of all my volunteers saved somewhere that I could fall back on if we were to lose power. So those are the those are the real four things that I got dinged on, and I don't feel bad about it. Now I know that that is the stuff that I need to work on moving forward, and that's what this program is meant to do: is to take your input and then make those suggestions on what to do next. So I'll focus on the lack of an EAP. And so let's go to the next slide. This is actually what I'll be doing here in the next couple of days is I'll be filling this out. I'll be filling out an emergency action plan for our organization. I've done one before for, uh, for the Red Cross office in Alaska where I come from. So I'm familiar with it. I just need to you know, make the time available. But uh, an emergency action plan, EAP, sorry, as an emergency responder, we live and die by our acronyms. So if you see an acronym on there and I don't explain it, I'm, I apologize. But um, emergency action plans are actually required by OSHA for all organizations with 10 or more staff. Um, I say staff, that can also include unpaid staff like volunteers. So if you have 10 people on site, you're required to have an EAP, and this will actually help you create one for your organization. Um, ideally, your organization will evaluate your emergency action plan uh, once a year and, and keep improving upon that plan. So this program is meant to be self-paced. When it was originally designed and funded, uh, it was meant to be something that I could send a, a link out to an organization. Hey, you need, an, you need a plan. Great. Here's the link. Follow it. It's self-paced. Good luck. And I, I really think that's inappropriate. And what I would like to do is, I would like to say is, if you have someone in your organization who is responsible for safety or who is passionate about creating a plan for your organization, I would actually invite them to reach out to me and either in person have mask, will travel if you feel so inclined, or virtually in a space like this, uh, I'll actually help sit down, take the time and help build uh, your emergency action plan with you. I think that's that's the most appropriate thing uh, is, is to actually help entities through this process because there is a lot of uh, disaster specific things that come up in that emergency action plan that I feel I would be doing a disservice if I didn't make myself able to answer those questions and be available to bounce ideas off of in regard to your preparedness as an organization. And so I am going to, so that's the original. Following along with my own slides here. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Oscar and let you take over from here. Great. So I want to start with just kind of getting like that was a lot of information, right? And that information was um, American Red Cross centered. And I want to just bring it back to why is it American Red Cross Center? It's American Red Cross does a really good job of identifying gaps and 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 supporting organizations create their own autonomy, their own way of responding um, so that when times do come, you don't have to rely on some American Red Cross responder getting to your, to your location. You, you can just kind of know, okay, we went through the training, we got our things set up in place. And so we can actually support our own community immediately, right away without having to make a phone call or wait on a first responder. Um, so this is the discussion section where it's kind of a space for you guys 
And I want to make sure that if you guys have any questions or if you guys have things that are, you know, circling in your heads that you know that this is a safe pace, place to kind of share that. And so I have some prompts here. So where, where you are now is kind of how I like to start a conversation when it comes to disaster preparedness, because you have to start somewhere, right? What strategies does your organization already use or do? Like, what do you have in place in terms of emergency action plan? Um, it could be as minimal as we have fire extinguishers and we know like how to use them and we, our kitchen has a safety protocol. Um, maybe that's where it stands because that's kind of how you have to keep up with code, building codes and whatever. Um, but I'd like you guys to kind of see like, like, where is it? Like what strategies does your organization already have in place for emergency action plan? Well, I know we have um, fire extinguishers. <laughs> Yeah, and um, probably our maintenance person um, would be able to take care of all that. What do you think, Amy? This is very, it's very eye-opening because I realized, I mean, I know I got handed like an employee handbook somewhere along the lines, right, that I've only skimmed, but I have no knowledge of what, you know, what to do in the event of a yeah, <laughs> you would think I would be one of the people that should have some knowledge of this. So um, I don't Birdie know. Birdie Wood and Scott I, Allen and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder how that information gets disseminated, though, because it's definitely, um, yeah, is it widely available or, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, our president and vice president, our two presidents are David Marshak and um, Bertie Welty. And um, our maintenance person is Scott Allen. Um, yeah, so I'm not really sure. I mean, I've been there for almost eight years now. And so pre-pandemic. And uh, we're all single story. We've got lots of doors to get out. So that's not a problem. Um, so what are, what are were some of the other questions? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's good to acknowledge that, you know, we are noticing that, you know, there are some, some things that maybe we want to know now, you know, there are some questions we have for the president, vice president, and the maintenance individual, Scott. Um, so these are good questions. Like, these are awesome. Like, they're, they're, the question wasn't designed to make you feel bad for where you are. It was just to acknowledge, um, you know, the truth of where, you know, that facility is at. And, and it can just help us be like, wow, like, how can I frame this now? Like, maybe there are some people who would be interested in knowing about this, because what if the only people who know something is, is Amy, the vice president and the president, and it happens to be the week that they're, you know, at Lake Berryessa uh, enjoying a nice evening or a nice weekend or something, right? Yeah. Um, so it's good. It's good to have that conversation. So that's, it seems like we've, we've gotten to a place of where we can acknowledge like where we are now. And it's not a bad thing. It's just an acknowledgement thing. Do you know where our property is, where our campus is? Yeah, it's over uh, um, like, Bayside Community Hall and then down the street, like that road. Yes, uh-huh, yeah. You, yeah. You know, as, as I'm looking down your checklist here, um, from what I've seen so far, I'm thinking about how our the layout of our building, our structure is, and I'm thinking that maybe some of the things on the checklist aren't even going to apply because of our structure, but it's good to go over all of them because we don't know, um, you know, what the future will bring as far as structure goes and we might find ourselves in a different structure someday. And it's good to have all this background knowledge. And um, I'm sure there are a lot of these things that do apply, but if we can't check everything off our list, because we don't have a staff of 10 or more, because the building is not very large and there's doors and windows everywhere. Um, 
uh, I think our escape plan is pretty easily covered, but this is good knowledge to have. I, I'm sure we'll get into a lot of other further things as the discussion goes along that we really need to know. So thank you. But right now the building is basically closed. I mean, uh, a lot of us have keys to get in and stuff, but we have an administrator that's there um, and a couple other people are there um, on during the week, but basically we're, we don't have any services or any um, meetings there at all right now. So a couple, a couple things to, to think. For, first of all, uh, the these plans are never meant to be uh, gotchas. Like ah, we got you. It's never meant to make anybody feel like they they're in the wrong. It is the mirror in which we measure ourselves against and say where could we improve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, if I look broadly across our community at all of our different faith-based organizations, community organizations, and ask myself, which one can we do without? And the answer is none of them. They're all providing incredibly meaningful services to the people who, who affiliate with that organization. And if I'm not helping them prepare and address those things that they may not um, even be aware of, uh, a couple of years ago, I know there was a big need to address security, like physical security and controlling access points. And what happens if there's a, a, a violent intruder, what we used to call active shooter. Um, and that was a big concern for a lot of organizations. Now we're looking at how do we sanitize hands and how do we check temperatures for, before uh, people enter our space and how do we protect those closest to us? Well, we've already gone through that. We had somebody that was that came to our property yeah. and we had to have him um, call the sheriff and everything and get him so he would not and come on our property, but he even came back. And so we, you know, we had to, you know, right. so we've had to deal with this um, before. Right. And, and so having those plans in place is, um, and talking through those those different concerns that come out of the well, have we thought about how would we contact everybody within our our, our church family, our congregation, uh, our faith our faith community? How would we contact everybody to just check on them after a catastrophic disaster to find out if everyone's okay? Um, our needs administrator them? has a list of everybody, and we'll send out an email. Outstanding. So in, in many ways, you are better prepared just by having that than many other businesses who haven't taken the, and not just businesses, but schools or other entities who haven't taken the time to actually think out those, those first initial steps, uh, you know, an organization could do. And so by filling out this survey, it's not meant to be a pass or fail. It's really meant to say, have you thought about and then have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And, and each of us has a directory, you know, of mm -hmm. all everybody, you know, I mean, I don't have an up-to-date one. Mine's 2019, <laughs> you know, but. Um, it is online though, and it's current online. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. We have a website. So, but yeah. And so that's, uh, there just as some suggestions on things to think about in regards to, uh, what I grew up calling my, my church family. Uh, and the reason I use that, use that term is I, I usually have a lot of these conversations in regards to preparedness with individuals and families. We're gonna get into that in a little bit again, but if we extend that radius about what we consider our family, you also have the family that you choose, sometimes not the family you're born into, but the family that you choose. And if we in include our faith-based community there, I wanna make sure those families are just as, are, they have access to preparedness information just as much as a, say a more traditional nuclear family may have, so. Andrew, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just know on your screen, but I, I can see that um, Danny has, has his, his virtual hand up there. Um, and I just wanted to say real quick, I, um, I have to go. I have another Zoom day I have to get to, but I'm so, so grateful to you guys for sharing all of this with us tonight. So I will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you very Bye, much. Amy. <laughs> Bye, Amy. Danny, you had a question. How can we help? Uh, having some trouble understanding you, Danny. 
having trouble understanding you. Your your voice is broken up quite a bit. Danny has left the room. Uh oh. Uh oh. Maybe she's going to try to come in again. Yeah. So sometimes calling in works best, and and what we can do is turn off our cameras just so that we can lower the bandwidth. Oh, okay. Should we do that? Well, maybe when she gets back, um, she's not in the in the meeting quite yet. Um, right. But she, right. But we'll we'll keep an eye out and um, make sure that when she does get back on, we can address her question. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, hi. Uh, sorry about that. Don't know what happened. Um, I was uh, thinking about the Small Business Development Center and business continuity planning that is done. And I think that this survey is just an excellent place to start for basically. Hello? Hello, Danny? Hello? Why is everyone's cameras off? Oh, uh, we put them off to lower the bandwidth so that um, in the hopes that um, reception would be improved. Yeah, that doesn't work how everyone thinks it works. Oh, uh, no. okay. Just want to let everyone know. Well, that. it was. I will definitely trust you on that one. <laughs> it was a stab in the dark, but our experiment showed us that it didn't work, I guess. Yeah. I don't think we're having much luck with Danny, but I did hear um like a mentioning of business says and and but you know i don't want to you know i don't want to assume what the question was and i i didn't hear enough of it unfortunately um mostly what i heard was can you hear me right <laughs> um okay so maybe before we continue um i just want to make sure that you know this this other section of the discussion is 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 something we can surface, which is, you know, what capabilities do you want the development, you know, want to develop as an organization? And I, I already heard that you guys have, you know, uh, you know, you have an ability to send an email blast to everyone at from Huff. You guys have a directory. Uh, you guys already took charge and, and, you know, got everything situated for having things be COVID safe and had the sheriff come out. Um, yeah, we have a board right. that meets regularly. Right. And, and that's, and that's, that's, those are the things that you need to kind of like help mobilize, you know, your community into the direction of, okay, we're going to get into this group. All these, these people, you guys are interested in this thing. You guys can like help us figure out a ways to do, you know, this X activity or pro program area or project or what, what it ever it may be. I'll also say on the behalf of Huff that we have like our Facebook page that we use to contact people as well as our Instagram and the directory is updated online right. um, that all of our members have access to. So. And we have a Zoom service every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And, and, and for those, weekly that comes out every week to let people know what's going on. And, and for those that um, um, are not, um, Te text, I mean, for those that um, don't have uh, computer access, uh, then we, um, you know, have uh, phone chains, you know, we, we keep in touch. That's, that's very strong, because that seems to be some one of the things that is disconnected is, you know, even even Andrew said it himself, where he got docked down for not having a physical copy, in case the power goes out. Um, and so it's good to have plans. Um, you know, like, you know, it, redundancy is great when you're planning for this type of stuff because you don't, you don't want to have a sense of, okay, our, our plan work failed and we don't have a backup plan. Like, what do we do now? Um, so, you know, just, just brainstorming on the idea and knowing that there's variability in disaster response. Um, you know, what other capabilities do you want to develop as an organization? In the past, we've heard, you know, you guys are working on like, you know, solar panel installations, but 
this can be more related to just you know the resilience within your your, your organization as a whole. Well, we've had solar for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think I understand what you're saying, Oscar. Kind of in the idea of. I mean, we don't have a minister right now. So like, that's kind of like the place that a minister would take, but just kind of having like a place to go emotionally when these disasters happen. Um, and like, we do have like our, our soul matters groups that like are open for those things. But like, if and when we get a minister, I think that's definitely something that we would want to make available. And, and then we also yeah. have counseling available through yeah. um, some former ministers, you know, that, that work with that aspect of it. And then aside from that, it's just individuals. We volunteer. We volunteer to keep in contact with everyone and keep, keep one another in the loop. Yes, we have four people on different days. If somebody wants to speak to them, they make an appointment and, and they'll speak, you know, and I know people that have used it, you know, because a lot of people can't handle the pandemic as well as others. Right. I just, I, I'm so like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a flashback when my parents were first entering this country and the person that they would go to and the, the family that would feed us was my, our minister. Um, he, our pastor was, you know, like he was, he was our rock for a little bit and, you know, without his guidance and support and just an open ear, I don't know where my parents would have been. Um, because it, it just was like, you know, it was, it was a counseling service to, to some extent. And, um, and so I'm glad that, you know, that you guys have like four, um, I think Amy mentioned that they were like retired ministers who are like mm -hmm. still offering counseling and, and, you know, men mentoring and guiding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. That's really awesome to know. Um, in terms of like, um, so like, I got a message from Danny, and he said he thinks he has his audio figured out. If you'd like to try again, I'd like to give him the chance to um, contribute. Can I ask you a question? You know Danny, right? Do you know Danny? I possibly. Is, is, is Danny a woman or a man? I, I honestly, I believe, I believe it. Uh, uh, well, it says he, him, so that's going to be my yeah, assumption. Oh, definitely. okay. I just didn't want to respond in a way that would, you know, hurt somebody's feelings or something. Absolutely. Is, is Danny on now? Is he, is his audio? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm here. Can you guys hear me okay? Oh, yes, hi, Danny. Hi, everybody. Sorry I was late, and then I'm sorry I was on some kind of weird cellular service that got me kicked off. I apologize. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to mention that uh, this survey is so fantastic and that um, it made me think of the business continuity planning that the North Coast Small Business Development Center does with small businesses. And uh, listening to the fellowship folks uh, speak about all the preparations they've already done, including the, the digital and non-digital redundancies is really um, amazing work for a small entity like, like you all, uh, because most don't do that. And um, the thing I love about this survey is that it really gets you and, and, you know, war game thinking isn't probably the right way to, to label it. You know, we've got all these old um, ways of talking about things that are, you know, it's, it's not a war game and the, you know, we're not fighting anybody, but, but basically this um, strategic thinking and this visioning of what could possibly go wrong. Um, you know, you could, you could really follow the rabbit hole and probably find some things that anybody can improve on. Right. So um, the, the, um, and one of the, one of my offices uh, got broken into recently and we realized that we needed to contact insurance to get the windows fixed. And we realized that we didn't have a current updated copy of the certificate of insurance. And then we realized that we didn't have a current contact for the person who helped us set that up back when we set it up. And so we couldn't reach out to that person. We had to go find a whole new person. So it's that kind of stuff that if you can imagine it ahead of time and play this little game with your um, trusted inner, inner circle, that you probably end up doing a better job on the other side. 
anyway, that's all I want to share. This is a great group, and uh, I really love the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Danny. It was, it's good to hear you and get to, to see you on, and that's some valuable insight. Uh, does, do you guys have any responses um, from the from the Huff side? Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> you know, we have a min an administrator that's already been there for a couple years, so she's you know she's there and she's there on the campus in her office a couple days a week right now. I think is she. Uh, Still there? Yeah, she's there. Yes. Yeah. She's there like three yeah. or four days a week. Yeah, yeah. And then our maintenance per person has been our maintenance person for a long time. And um, so there is longevity in some of our people. Of course, you know, the board of trustees changes all the time. Um, but we have a way that we have two co-presidents and then a vice president. So, so the president, two co-presidents, one's been there longer. So when they retire, then we've got somebody in line to take the vice president to move into the president. So we're training those people as it goes. And then, you know, then there's a secretary and a treasurer and trustees and stuff. So yeah, we work it really well. So I guess, let me, uh, it's okay, pose another question to the group and uh, see, see where this kind of lands. One of the things that we focus on or, or in the back of our mind is that big catastrophic emergency and Oscar alluded to this earlier is what happens when the Red Cross doesn't show up? Uh, and we will do everything that we can. I've got 76 volunteers right now, but this last wildfire season, I'll use that as an example. We had active wildfires in all three of my counties and I didn't have enough people to cover all of the needs that were addressed. Now imagine that um, a scenario that cut off the roads and our nearest backup in Lake or Mendocino or from Reading couldn't get here. Um, we have a catastrophic earthquake and now all of these little islands of humanity have, are really cut off from each other. Think about where your building is located and where your members are located and then kind of radiate out one step beyond that and the neighborhood those maybe other faith-based organizations that you may have an affiliation with, uh, the businesses or, or community organizations that you're, you traditionally work with or you're comfortable working with. Um, what do you see you could potentially do? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Like, ah, if the worst were to happen, we could do, and whatever comes to your mind. Well, we I, have, you know, quite a few people who live in Arcata and Bayside and then people who live in McKinleyville and Eureka and even down in Fortuna. So the people that live closer um, would definitely um, want to see, you know, protect the property, you know. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, unless they, you know, they were in such bad shape themselves, you know, I mean, yeah, so, right. you know. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll really faith-based organizations really comes to mind when I think about this, go, oh, we could be a shelter or we've got a commercial grade kitchen. If we had access to the foodstuffs, we could really start to help feed people right away. Uh, yeah, I, we, I have, think we have a big kitchen and we've tried to have it that we could have start a garden there, but it's been hard because, you know, uh, <laughs> you got to have three dedicated people, you mm -hmm. know, to start it and you know maintain it and all that stuff and uh, we're just afraid that it'll as so many when people start a garden they like it for a year and then they stop you know <laughs> so. right and so the reason that I, I'm really passionate about creating this plan for uh, for an organization is uh, whatever that role it is that you think your community your 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 your, your faith-based organization or community or church family however you define yourself I want you all to be able to do that I want you all to be able to I need you all uh, I'll even go that far to say when the chips are all down and we need everybody in our community chipping in as much as they reasonably can uh, we need you yeah but it's unfair of me to uh, to make that ask if you haven't taken those initial steps to make sure your own preparedness is in a place. It's like mm -hmm. being able to take care of you know, yourself, then your family, then your neighbors. And, and the better prepared you are and, and kind of going through these questions and evaluating your level of preparedness, 
uh, really means that you may end up being in a better place to actually help your neighbors versus needing them to come come help you. When there's nothing wrong with that, if that is what ends up, and I think in most large disasters, organizations that are affiliated with each other tend to reach out to each other and very quickly establish those coalitions of individuals who are, and COVID is a great example of that between the work that I've seen uh, Cooperation Humboldt has done, uh, building these coalitions and going out and doing that work right away. Uh, there will be more people able to do that if they are better prepared. Yeah, um, when we had Brian Jessup for our minister, he was really great at getting really talking to, talking to all the other ministers and really, you know, but um, he retired and we got another minister who unfortunately couldn't stay with us as it turned out. That's why we're without a minister right now, but we're searching for a new minister. But, you know, having, a, a, you know, we do have people that are in charge and that are longtime members, you know, so. Excellent. So, which kind of leads me to the next slide, if you think it's a kind of appropriate to move on to the next part, is it doesn't necessarily have to be the minister, and I understand how important that role is to the community, uh, but anybody who's in an, an administrative, I think maybe the individual who has that longevity of knowledge within your maintenance, uh, the gentleman who, who works maintenance, um, I would be willing to around their schedule when they're available to sit down with them, either in person at six feet interval, masks on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or in a space like this to actually walk them through this program. Because I think mm -hmm. in its early implementation, that's where the Red Cross went wrong. We just sent it out there and said, good luck. I hope you figured it out. Um, and, and I think we should be doing a better service by our partners to say, wait, hold up. I will do this alongside you. And there's things that I need to work on. I'm not perfect when it comes to this. It's like the cobbler has the worst shoes in town. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that I would like to be, I, I would like to be a good partner to anyone who would be interested. And this ready rating program is really meant for organizations collectively, you know, your staff, your people on site to include anyone who's visiting with you temporarily. If it's a business, I would say a customer, but for faith-based organizations, I would go as far as including your congregation or visiting, visiting members as well. Um, individuals you may serve in the community. If they're going to be on site when that emergency happens, they need to be a part of that plan. So if you all are willing, or if you would like to volunteer somebody, um, let me know who, who that is. And I'd be willing to make time outside of this, this conversation right now and actually go through those, those steps. Well, our presidents, uh, David Marshak and Bertie Welty, mm -hmm. would be a good place to start. And do you, do you need their in, uh, information? Absolutely. Um, let's see, go in the front of the book here. Okay, I'm gonna get- I just okay. also wanna chime in that it's a little confusing when we're talking about disaster preparedness during a pandemic and I'm just sometimes confused whether we're talking about yeah. a time not during the pandemic or <laughs> are we talking about right now during the pandemic? Like, and I know like time is going to go on and it's going to be prepared for anything. So I guess I, yeah. my lines are a little blurred on that. It, it's a fair question. And I think my unfair answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and the reason I say that is um, for example, there was a house fire last night we had to respond to that house fire and we did that Dude, it was right next to my friend's house i saw all the damage today it was crazy yeah and we still had to respond to that you know, but we had to wear masks we had to alter how we know our response we're not doing the hugs that we used to do and the handshakes that we used to do uh, during the wildfire we still provided shelter to individuals, but the strategy that we used was procuring hotel rooms and then getting families and individuals into those hotel rooms versus, or compared to how we usually do sheltering, which is a, a gymnasium or a church with a big open space and lots of cots. Um, we've had to work in and around COVID. And while preparedness right now is slightly different because a lot of our businesses and churches and schools aren't open. So a lot of these plans, they're going, well, we won't need it because there's nobody here. But you know, having that call down plan, doing that check, and a lot of the work that you all seem, I, to me, it seems like you've already done a lot of good work to get you ready. You have the mechanisms in place to be better prepared for your, your 
church family, your congregation now, when they really need that person to talk to, when they need that helping hand and saying, hey, I really need someone to go to the grocery store and pick up these groceries for me. I can't get exposed to COVID. You have those network, you have that network, you have that support system already in place. And by doing the work ahead of the emergency, in this case, COVID, um, you are better prepared. And if you have that in place because of COVID or if you established it because of COVID, the next time we have an earthquake or a flood or a wildfire, um, your organization is actually better prepared. Fine. Well, I'd say that I'd be willing to come talk to your congregation in person. Of course, COVID being what it is, that's not a reality right now. <laughs> um, but we have something called Be Red Cross Ready. It's a really fancy way of saying, here are the three initial steps that everybody should consider when it comes to their own personal or their, their family's uh, preparedness. And, and how we define a family is absolutely up to you. It could be roommates. It could be two individuals who just happen to live with each other. That's fine. But the idea is if you're going to be confronted by this emergency and you're going to be a, a team, then, then consider yourself and work together. And I would also include children and your pets into your plan. Um, it affects them right alongside. So, um, but we're going to talk about those steps really quick. And, and, and in both cases, both re the ready rating and be Red Cross ready, no one's going to walk out of this being an expert. It's just meant to, to, sh to, to show these are the things that I can provide. And I would like to make the deliberate, the, the, be very deliberate about making uh, time available for the broader organization. If you'd like your members to participate in a more in-depth class based on these three steps, I will take the time to do it. But just getting it in front of you while saying, this is a thing, if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to participate, I'd be willing to come back and provide that. But our, our three steps are uh, be informed. Okay, so officially our steps are make a kit, make a plan, be informed. It's actually the other way around. What I find is the making a kit is the first stumbling block. There are a lot of individuals who are having to make really hard decisions about, am I going to replace my muffler or am I going to get braces for my kids? Am I going to pay rent? Where is lunch coming from? And to start off the bat with saying, you need to start buying these things and place them under your bed or in your cabinet or in your garage or wherever you're gonna store your kit, that's the wrong place to start. That's why I ask people to first be informed. You know, where, what are the, where, what are the risks that you may face? And a, a house fire can be just as devastating as, a, as losing your job. As many people right now are experiencing. More than that. Yeah, absolutely. And so being informed about what the different crisis you and your family, uh, you or, and or your family could face and really identifying those. Once you identify what those are, then you make your plan. If A happens, we will then do B, we will then do C. If B happens, we'll then do A and then we'll do B. Whatever your plan needs to look, but that plan needs to be tailored to your family's needs and the scenario that you are, the scenarios, plural, that you're planning for. Once you, once you know what you're planning for, then you have your plan, then and only then do you really start looking at building your kit. Yeah, uh, and that is the putting the thing, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a Rambo style bag with all of these tools and gizmos and gear. It's things like having enough medication, you know, having, you know, written down, like, I have hundreds of phone numbers saved, but I, at this point, have, I've memorized my wife's number and that's about it. If I needed to call my volunteers and I didn't have access to this, I don't know, writing, writing those sort of things down. Having a place nearby your home that your family could meet at. Hey, if we can't get a hold of each other, we're all going to go to, you know, the tree with a tire swing on it. Um, if we have to go further than that, we're all going to meet at Huff. You know, whatever it is that's going to fit your family's needs, having that plan and including everybody in your family and what that plan is, and then giving everybody a little bit of responsibility in regards to that plan, including kids, giving them some simple basic tasks like your job is to get the collar, the leash, and make sure our dog is ready to leave with us. It gives them purpose in a really stressful moment, and it makes them feel empowered versus seeing mom and dad run around crazy trying to put things together after the ground stops shaking. And so this sort of training and this sort of education is stuff that I would love to come back when you all feel is appropriate and give you a much more in-depth uh, a presentation based on these three steps. And I cheat. I flip the program around a little bit because I think it's more appropriate. Please don't tell my boss.
Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really liking the, the way you're pitching that, Andrews, you know, inclusiveness. And, and it's up to the, the representatives of Huff to kind of see if that interest is there or, you know, when it does come that someone says like, hey, this is interesting to me, um, to get them involved and, and to, you know, make them feel useful or allow them to collaborate in some way. So now we're gonna um, go to the next slide, right, Andrew? Yep. So when it comes to being informed, we're looking at, and, and so I, I, I've done this presentation so many times, I kind of just started going into it and I apologize. Um, so I'll do, I'll, I'll kind of backtrack a little bit quickly. It's really is, um, what are the most likely disasters you could face? Um, what, how would time of day affect your family's plan? Um, if, if, you know, it's a family of four and both mom and dad are working and kids are, are at school, again, this is pre-COVID, how does that affect your plan versus two o'clock at the night when at two o'clock at night when everyone's at home? That that will influence your plan. Um, how do you get your notifications about emergency? Do you have an app that goes off when there's an emergency? Do you get um, a notification from social media? Uh, do you get weather alerts? Uh, are you listening to your radio? What are the traditional ways that you're going to get that get that notice that something isn't right? You need to enact your plan. And then how do you how do you continue to maintain your situational awareness? You know, as a disaster, once a disaster happens, usually it's rarely happens and then it's just over. Very rarely that's the case. Usually there, there, there's an ebb and there's a flow to it. As the situation evolves, how do you continue to get your information? Um, that becomes really important when it comes to being informed and enacting our plan, whatever that plan is going to be. So once we're a little bit more informed about, so and once we're a little bit more informed about what the hazards are, what we could be facing, uh, the next thing is we want to make uh, make a plan. Uh, usually, when I give this, you can just follow those QR codes with your smartphone. It takes you right to those family plans. I also have those links, and we also have these links embedded in this presentation, and so you'll have those as well. Um, just like the ready rating has a survey and, and a toolkit to help you build a plan for your organization. Uh, we have a, a simple tool for families to build a preparedness plan. And that's what you see on the left hand of the screen. On the right hand of the screen is something we can talk about a little bit later. And the idea is, is once you've talked about one individually and as a family, you've built your, your plan, what are the things that you could do alongside your neighbors? How, what could the people on your street do collectively to make sure if the earthquake happens and we're all on our own, what, what do we do? What could we do? And, and, and really that, that neighborhood resiliency grows from there. And that's a program called Map Your Neighborhood. If there's an interest in looking into that, I would love to revisit that conversation a little bit better, but I, I think it's a little bit, um, it's putting the cart before the horse. I'd really love to talk more about personal preparedness and organizational preparedness before we start reaching out to the community and looking at broader community-wide preparedness. Right, I agree so, with that. Yeah, Huff has to be the example, right? And then, you know, people will follow along. So, and that also touches on those resilient hubs, which is a really a lot of running, uh, a running theme throughout, um, throughout this series. And uh, then the last one is then building the kit, like I mentioned, and that kit's going to be different for everybody. Uh, there are a few standard things that um, everybody really should be considering if you're looking at a kit and you need uh, a gallon of water per person per day. Logistically, that's a lot of water. Uh, I've got five people in my family, five gallons a day, and your plan should really last you. We used to sit, FEMA used to say you should have enough stuff for three days. Um, my volunteers during the wildfire held it down all on their own for two and a half weeks before reinforcements showed up. And that is because of the topography, that's where we live, how far we are from help. I would recommend having at least a week's worth of stuff on hand or readily available. That doesn't mean that you have to have it at your house, in your garage, but collectively as a community, do we have access to the things that we would need to sustain ourselves for a week until utilities could be restored. Uh, if you have members in your organization who require electricity to help them throughout their everyday life, power chairs, uh, respiratory aid, whatever that may be, what are their plans if we lose power? And so um, th those kits will look very differently than a family just starting on a journey themselves, you know, mom, dad, and brand new kid, 
or um, individuals where their adult children have moved out of the house and, and have also started their own lives. Those two plans can look vastly different, but there will be some similarities. And I'd like to cover that in depth when you all have the time. So next slide. So that's all I have for right now. I'll, I'll Oscar, I'll let you take it. Yeah. So this slide I wanted to leave for the end because I wanted it to just be a conversation on resilience and inner resilience. So we just went and, you know, Andrew gave a lot of information about how ARC can come into a play and, you know, really, you know, bring support and, and, and you know, help build resilience by offering trainings, um, by giving guidance. Um, and so we, we learned about scheduling a follow-up with Andrew to kind of get walkthrough of that ready rating um, program. And then there's trainings that are offered. There's trainings that you guys can look at your own, on your own you know, that, that, that Huff would be interested in. And then Andrew just finished mentioning, you know, resources, like where is the water? Where is the food? Where is immediate shelter? All these things that are just important to know. But why are those things important? Like, why do we speak of these things? Is because we speak, we're speaking about resilience as a whole. And, and I'm talking about resilience mostly instead of preparedness, because when you think of preparedness, preparedness is just like, okay, I'm prepared. But when you think of resilience, it adds, it adds layers. It adds layers to your preparedness. So why are you resilient? What, what makes you a resilient household? Okay, so you, you've practiced, you've, you, you have a, a plan, you have all the immediate supplies. And, and now I wanna take a moment to talk about like what that helps. That helps, what that really helps is your inner resilience. And your inner resilience is your mentality. You know, like an, an earthquake happens. Of course, we're all gonna be startled and we're gonna be shaken a little bit, but immediately you know in the back of your head, I have a plan, I have a kit, my family knows what to do. And so that sense of shock will immediately be you know, taken away due to your resilient nature because you take the time to become a resilient household. Now, maybe you've gotten as far as mapping your neighborhood and you know that Larry down the street has plenty of energy or, you know, uh, <laughs> generator. Yeah, exactly. And so, and so basically like this, this slide is really just to emphasize, okay, why are we not just prepared, but resilient? Like we are a resilient household. We're a resilient community. Um, Huff is a resilient organization. We have, you know, the administrator sending out the emails already. Like you don't have to worry about your close friends. Right? You have a reason not to be worried because you have this sense of inner resilience through the resilience preparation work that you're doing that is more than just being prepared. It's, it's being strong in, 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 in your own house and your own, like, you know, sticking to your guns, essentially. Um, this slide was really just to kind of lay it out there to kind of take a step back and say, we, what we are doing here is talking about our inner resilience, what supports our inner resilience is how we are just a resilient household, resilient within our communities and just overall prepared. Um, I wanted to see if, if anyone had any ways of describing like, like if you are resilient now, what makes you resilient? And if you feel like you could be more resilient, how could you be more resilient? And, and I ask these questions because we don't always get the chance to really like express ourselves uh, in terms of like, you know, we think about disasters and we know that they're coming. We know that, you know, disasters are, you know, beyond us, they're, they're natural to an extent. And so like, you know, what, what does it mean to be resilient to you, like as an individual? Well, I, this fall, I got up to my, um, what I, water I'm getting from my roof from 100 gallons to 500 gallons. So I've got a lot of water. You know, so I think water is kind of the hardest thing to keep, you know, so I've got the water. I've got a wind up radio. So if things go out and I'm, I have solar on my roof, so I'm going to be getting sometime, I don't know when, um, a Tesla battery so that with the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, it'll change the, the solar coming from my house right to charging my house, you know. So I'm, I'm working on this stuff already, you know, to, so I'll be, uh, you know, okay. And then I have a, a, my whole yard is edible landscape. 
So um, everybody, it's my front yard and my backyard, but some of my neighbors have, um, you know, gardens in the backyard, but um, yeah, so people will be coming to me for food probably and water. <laughs> right. And, and you know, that, that, that begs the question is like, it shouldn't just be your home that has these, you know, these resources. It should be your neighbor's homes as well. And, and to have, I think this is why I'm so glad Cooperation Humble can do this project alongside ARC is because we try to share that culture, right? Food sovereignty, um, you know, being able to turn your lawn into a, a, a mini food forest or a permaculture setup and, and doing so because it's beneficial, not just to your own health and your longevity, but because, you know, when you see good things, neighbors want to, you know, emulate those other good things and you, and you are an influencer at that point. And, you know, we're, we're humans. We want to be accepted. We want to learn new things and we want to be healthy. Um, it's not the same how everyone gets there, but it's good to know that you're doing your part on your own on your own terms. Yeah, one of the things I like to I like to talk about in those big emergencies, those catastrophic ones, the earthquakes. Um, you, in Florida, it'd be hurricanes, but here for it's earthquakes, tsunamis, wildfires. Um, the same person who would keep an eye on your house while you're on vacation. The same person who would. Um, you know, knock on your door really quickly. They see smoke coming from your house. The, the same person who would jump your car so you're not late to work. Those little emergencies and house fire is not a little emergency, just to, to put that out there. Um, but those are your first responders. You know, in those big catastrophic disasters, there'll never be enough EMTs, firefighters, Red Cross. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really does become the first person who can hold out their hand to you. They just became a first responder. They're meeting your immediate need. Um, and, and in turn, if anybody can hold a ladder, if you can hold a flashlight, if you can knock on a door, you too can become a first responder. And, and you can become that person for your friend across the street. When I talk about home fire preparedness, one of the things I say is get to know your neighbors. If you don't, you know, find that one person you know, that you think you could reach out to and you may trust. If you've got kids, look for the other person in your neighborhood that's got toys in the front yard. You probably have something to commiserate over, but find that person that you trust, knock on their door and say, hey, if there were a fire at my house, so can I stash a bag of extra clothes, some important paperwork, and can I tuck it away at your house? And I'll do the same for you. If you had to leave your home, you'll have those initial things you know, that, that you would need right away. And you can come here and wait out the storm you know, while the fire department douses everything and you'll have a warm, dry place and I can make tea for you. That interconnectivity, that, that, that sense of community and that inter, yeah, the interconnectivity, I think is the word I'd, I'd prefer to use, um, is really where resiliency is born out of. It's, it's not just a list of things that we have squirreled away. It is who we know and what we're willing to do for those individuals safely um, I believe uh, that's, that's the kind of resiliency I'd like to help build, weave back into our fabric of society. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. And, and I feel like sadly we've, we've strayed too far away from that, from knowing our neighbors, from being, mm -hmm. stepping away from individualism. Um, you know, in America, I feel like you are proud, like there's a sense of pride in terms of how individual you can be, how on your own you can be. Um, but you know, I think when we when we reach out to our neighbors and extend the relationships that we have within our communities, uh, we learn more and we're able to share more. So we're we're able to be learners and educators um, just through relationship building. Once yeah, I, I, I know most of the neighbors in my in my on my street. Yeah. Yeah, and and jo Joanne, can I ask how how many years you've stayed on that street to to get to know those neighbors? Uh, seven years. That's that's awesome. Like a lot of people go a decade and don't even know their next door neighbors. And so, like that's the type of culture that we need. And and I really just want to like highlight that those small things that you know we normalize, um, they're not so normal. And they're, they're, they are profound. And and those are the advantages that members of Huff have over you know a, a different organization. All right, so we're gonna move on to our closing thoughts. 
because I want to make sure that you guys have enough space. We, we are scheduled till 730. So we can have, you know, a breakdown on, on things that we learned, takeaways, things that you guys felt were important. Uh, we also have a closing quote that we'll share at the very end. I'll let Andrew share it. But again, like this, this space over here at the end is just to kind of like, like what was confusing, what worked, what didn't work, what are you still trying to grasp? Uh, there are no bad questions. Um, all the feedback is widely, widely accepted and, and much appreciated. And again, we appreciate Huff taking the time to let us share this information we think is an equally as important. I'll say this just like as a question um, for American Red Cross, like you say, get informed. Um, how wonderful would it be if there was just an app that the Red Cross provided of like where all the disasters are and like where to go to volunteer and that kind of thing. I don't know, I had that idea a long time ago just cause like I, like I said, I'm from Sonoma County and I get a lot of phone calls of like, hey, will you look up where the fires are? Cause we have no electricity here. And how great would it be if there was just an app where you could see where the fires are? So you know, if you're like in trouble, <laughs> I don't know, that, that's my, my closing thought anyway. So thank you guys so much for being here again. That's the emergency app right there. It's free on the app, on any app store for Andrew, uh, for sorry, Andrew, <laughs> Android or iPhone. It is called the emergency app. It's free. It's by the Red Cross. And you can absolutely download that. And it, it pulls data from the National Weather Service, from the G, uh, G, from GI, um, earthquake people. <laughs> I am so sorry. My It's been a long day and my brain is fried. Um, but it monitors earthquakes, it monitors weather, it monitors um, NC web for wildfires and will send alerts to your phone. You can also uh, geofence other neighborhoods you would like to watch. So if your family lives in Florida and you're worried about hurricanes, like mine do, um, my parents live in Florida. You can actually drop in other addresses and it will monitor those locations. And so if there's a hurricane in Texas and that's where your brother lives, it'll ding your phone and you can call them real quick. Hey, just saw there was a hurricane, is everything okay? And if there is something wrong, not also will it tell you that, hey, there's been a flood warning in your area, it will then also prompt you on those immediate next steps that you could take. Um, so there is that. And I think we'll probably end up adding that to the slide. I think that would be a really important thing to, to, to add in this moving forward. The other thing is if you are interested in say volunteering, this is something that I tend to shy away from is I don't ever want to poach somebody else's members from their organization and, and try to you, you, you start that, bring them into mine. We always need more volunteers. I, I will honestly say we do need more volunteers, um, but there are many places, Huff included, that have an amazing workforce, an unpaid workforce, that could be mobilized during a disaster. And so I don't know, I, I always don't feel like this is an appropriate place to kind of make that pitch for volunteers. But individually, if someone wanted to have that conversation with me, um, I'd be willing to, to you know, send you the information to join the Red Cross. Um, I, would also, I would also tell people to keep in mind that you can volunteer for multiple locations. Um, like I have got Red Crossers who are also CERT community emergency response team members. I have people who volunteer at schools when they are open. Um, I have people who volunteer so many different places that I never see them actually. And that's okay. Um, you fit it into your life when you have the time, um, but it's not for everybody. And I understand that some people just want to like, Hey, this is my lane. This is where I feel safe and comfortable. Great. And when that moment comes, we're going to reach it. We're going to reach out to that organization where you work and we may ask them to help. Please be prepared for that. I just wanted to say a brief thing about water. I know when in creating preparedness kits, it's always been recommended have a whole lot of bottled water. Um, if uh, one has access to water at all, even if it's only water out of a stream or whatever, you know, that they have access to and they don't have access to anything else, um, they're, um, there are, uh, I'm not suggesting a Brita pitcher because it doesn't do a whole lot, but there's something called zero water and it's 99.99 something percent, you know, that it purifies, 
you know, for you. If you carry that along with your bottled water, when your bottled water runs out, you don't really have to worry if you have access to any kind of water. The only, um, the only time that I, I don't know if there's anything to cover is if one's uh, access to water is saline. I don't know what you do in that case. Okay. So when it, when it comes to water, uh, and I, I don't really want to get into the weeds of like the tactics of preparedness because there's, right. there's big Berkey water filters. There is life straw. There is um, at least three different camping brands of water filters I have owned th throughout my, my, my time. There is iodine tablets. There are, there's, there's, you can do, uh, a, it's like a, it, there's a, I won't, don't quote me on this because I don't have it in front of me. Usually I have it in black and white. When I talk about preparedness is the amount of a uh, gallon of water to amount of bleach that is actually safe for human consumption. And it, it is a minuscule amount, but it would kill all the, 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 the bacteria inside of a, uh, a thing of water. You can boil water. There, uh, water would yeah. would cure bacteria, but it wouldn't get rid of heavy metals and thing other you know right. just things like that. Right, water. I have, sorry. No, it's absolutely okay. Um, there, there are a number of things that you can do to procure water uh, for yourself, and so it's good to have. You know, I would say more than one way of doing that. Uh, when I grew up in hurricane country, we'd always you know hey. The water in the back of your uh, commode, the one that had when you haven't flushed yet, that's still clean water. <laughs> There's a mental break. There's a mental break that people are like, nah, nah, I'm good. You can fill up, <laughs> the other thing is you can fill up your tub, you can fill up your sinks, you can actually, and that's if you have an emer if you if you know there are, um, uh, you have a warning. A lot of our emergencies right now, right. earthquakes. There's no warning the water mains will break. Those traditional places you're used to getting water from won't be available to you. Um, I, I think it'd be, it'd be really critical to kind of, as a community, map out those locations where potable water or water that is easy to turn into potable water. So we're not looking at salt water. We've got a lot of salt water out there. Wouldn't recommend drinking any of it. But where are those freshwater sources that we could collect, purify? Well, who's going to do that? Where are the resources, the, the technology, and there's simple technology, three sticks and some cloth, and you really have the beginnings of a water filtration system. Yay, the army taught me great things. Um, but you also need charcoal, you need sand, you need, you, you need cloth membrane to start filtering things out. Um, you can do that. It just takes people who are saying, hey, we'll become the water purification team if that's the thing that needs to be done. And I've got the knowledge and they've got the hands and they've got the truck and we're going to go do this. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if we ever need to get that finite with our planning, but knowing it in the back of our mind. And then here's the other thing. There is a generation of elders out there who have that knowledge. And as they pass away and as they leave us, they are taking that knowledge with them and people my age and younger are very slow to learn. We need to capture that before it's gone permanently. That was a really morose way of ending this conversation. Please don't let it end on this on that topic. Well, it's not morose when you consider it, um, you know, thinking of your elders and respecting, you know, all the knowledge and wisdom that they've gained over time. And I want to comment on this because it's relevant to a recent opportunity our group has been open to. We've been invited to sit on a board for Transition US. Um, the, the, the conference is centered around um, intergenerational participation. And so we're engaging youth and encouraging youth to reach out to their elders and to um, you know, adults in the community so that they can share their creative intuition and, and innovative ideas as well as gain insights and wisdom from older generations who, you know, who are still fighting similar battles that these generations also don't agree with, you know, uh, coal emissions, uh, climate change, you, know, you name it. There's a lot of overlap in what, you know, me as a 23 year old and someone as a 54 year old, you know, we, we think a lot of the same things. Like there are still a lot of wrong things in the society that need to be changed. And so, um, 
you know, and just to add to that, you know, we are also working with the NorCal um, Resilient Hub Network, and they have, you know, basically told us that they are going to be in support throughout our process and us working with Huff. So this is a six week, you know, training and we're sharing as much as we as we can and we're trying to learn from you guys as well, but it doesn't stop there. Um, so after the six weeks are done, um, Cooperation Humble and Andrew, you know, we will still be a phone call away, an email away. Uh, we will definitely be, be, be people to keep checking in with you guys and make sure that if you guys are looking for additional support that we can share the, those resources. Um, and obviously we don't want to bombard you and you know push you in any one direction because it's ultimately it's the direction you guys want to take it. Um, it's, it's wherever you guys have the capacity, wherever you guys have the bandwidth. And we want to respect and honor that because you guys are already doing such great things and have a lot of tools under your tool belt. I see an unsaid quote there, Andrew. Well, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, that's absolutely true in, in many, many cases. Um, I don't have any really good examples right now, but um, if anybody else does, I'll listen. But I know that all of the work that we're putting into getting our volunteers orientated and trained and ready for the next wildfire season, um, I know from experience that that will pay off dividends later. Um, we walked into last wildfire season with about 11 volunteers. You know, walking into the next wildfire season, we're not even there yet. We already have 76. And I, I, and I a little scale of economy, to run a shelter, it takes 11 volunteers. Um, so that's day shift and a night shift. And uh, volunteer math works, uh, you can only mobilize 10% of your workforce at any given time. So if I need 11 people, I need, I will ultimately need to have 110 volunteers on the books. We're a little over halfway there, but we still have a lot of work to go. And if the disaster is in our own backyard, um, you know, all those individuals may be affected by it. So getting that work done, taking those small incremental steps with, by working with my community partners and those members who may be alongside me during that disaster means that maybe I don't need to have 100, 110 volunteers. Maybe I just need to have 110 phone numbers and I know other organizations to reach out to, so, but yeah. All right, so thank you all so much. I just wanna share some positive thoughts because this is, it's just, Traditionally dry, this information is not super exciting, right? The way that this is framed definitely needs work because we need people to want to engage and like actually want to do this stuff. We want it to be cool. And ways to do that is through art mediums, um, you know, engagement projects, right? Everyone's cooped up and like looking for anything to just, just be around someone that speaks and, and just like, you know, shares how their day went, even if the day wasn't going well, it'd be nice to hear that and to offer that warm ear. Um, so there are opportunities in the mist. Think about how to get creative. Next week, we're gonna talk about becoming a resilient hub. And so that week is gonna be, so if you you know, have ideas and things of how to make things interesting and fun and not just a presentation on a screen, um, next week will be a great week to kind of help like share and explore those ideas um, because becoming a resilient hub can be a fun engaging collective process it doesn't have to be backbreaking and dry and needed it, it needs to it doesn't need to be needed it needs to be like people want to do this you know we need people to want to do this well i'll let uh, you know we don't have to juice out these last three minutes because I feel like I got a lot from this and thank you guys all for sharing and being open. Uh, it was a pleasure to do this training with you guys and we hope to see many of you next week.